Hey everybody, welcome to lesson number three in this Bible study unit that we are calling The Beauty of Restoration. It is a study of the last three and a half chapters or so of the Gospel of John. There is a listening guide for this lesson. You're going to want that. You'll find it the same place you found this video. Just scroll down a little further and click on that link. It's a PDF that you can download and then print out. There are some blanks to fill in during the teaching portion of the lesson, and then there are some discussion questions on there for you and your small group to go through after the teaching portion. You're also going to want your Bible or your Bible app open to John chapter 19, verses 1 through 5. That's where we'll be today. Before we jump into the lesson, let's pray, shall we? Father, it's because all of us fail. All of us, we know we disappoint you from time to time that we know that all of us then are, need, are in need of restoration. And so our prayer as we open your word today is that you will open our hearts and that you will teach us about restoration. Where does it come from and what does it look like and what are the elements to it? Our prayer, Lord, is that you'll change us, that you'll change how we understand who we are, that you'll change our understanding of who you are, that you'll change how we see the world around us. We want to be different. Would you do that for us, Father? Will you more and more transform us into the people that you've called us to become? We love you. We love your word, and we love its place in our lives. And we pray all of this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Restoration, putting something that has failed back into the state that its creator or its owner intended for it. Spiritual restoration, then, is putting us uh, back into the very love relationship with God that we were created for, that God intended for us. That's what we're talking about. We're walking through these final days of Jesus' ministry, His arrest, His trial, His crucifixion, His burial, His resurrection. And we're asking with each of these lessons the same question. We're asking, what does this, what do these circumstances in Jesus' ministry, what does it teach us about restoration? We're following these last days of Jesus' ministry, and we're considering the price that he paid for our restoration. Last week, we saw Jesus before Pilate in a conversation with Pilate, and we learned about this connection between truth and our restoration. Restoration, if it's genuine, is going to be grounded in truth. It's going to be based upon truth. Today, we're going to see Pilate subject Jesus to unspeakable torture and pain and ridicule before delivering his ultimate verdict over Jesus. Jesus has been tried before Caiaphas. That trial went through the night. They brought him then to Pilate because they want to put him to death. Last week he had his conversation with Pilate. Pilate concluded that Jesus has not done anything which would warrant crucifixion. But Pilate, frankly, is being controlled much more by political correctness and by the political forces at play than he is by truth. So he takes everything then to the next level, which is where today's lesson in chapter 19, verses 1 through 5 picks up. Let's just see what they have to say, beginning in verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. So we don't know exactly what Pilate's strategy here is. We don't know what he's thinking or what he's hoping for. We can speculate. Maybe he was hoping that the scourging would somehow evoke some sympathy from these Jewish leaders and make them change their minds. Uh, maybe he was hoping that the scourging would actually elicit a more direct confession from Jesus, one that Pilate could hang his hat on in order to crucify Jesus. Maybe he was just simply hoping to make Jesus' death on the cross, which is coming, happen quicker, because the scourging would certainly have accomplished that. Or maybe, maybe it was some combination of all of these things. We just don't know. But here's what we do know. We do know from historical documents that the kind of scourging that Jesus would have been subjected to, this flogging, that it was horrendous. I mean horrific. It would have been unspeakable pain and torture. It literally shreds the skin on the back, laying bare 
muscle tissue, and in some cases, even internal organs. There were, there were many cases, according to the historical documents, there were many cases where, where people actually died from the flogging. So certainly it would have brought about death much sooner on the cross. Add to that then the humiliation of the soldiers mocking Jesus, perhaps even the Jewish leaders mocking Jesus as well. And there's just something particularly authentic about Jesus going through these horrific struggles in order to offer us spiritual restoration. It just, it gives him so much more credibility as the one offering that restoration. I'm reminded of the writer of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, the writer of Hebrews says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. So I think it's an, an important takeaway for us, an important realization when we think about our restoration, that the one who is offering this restoration knows something about our struggles. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first statement on your listening guide. Our struggles in this life neither entitle us to nor disqualify us from genuine spiritual restoration, but we can be assured that the God who restores us knows our struggles intimately. There's just something reassuring about the fact that, that the same God who is offering me restoration from my own failures and my own struggles has been through unbelievable struggles himself. There's something authentic about that. But then look again at what Jesus went through. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put, him on the, put it on his head and arrayed him in purple robe. They came up to him, mocking him, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Maybe, maybe the more obvious takeaway here is just the sheer price that Jesus paid personally in order to purchase our spiritual restoration, my spiritual restoration. This week at the, in the everydayprayer.com pastor's blog in the devotionals that the pastors write, Brian Richardson just really nailed this concept. And I can't try to put it in my own words. I just want to use Brian's words. Listen to the way Brian described this price. Brian says, When did Jesus bear on himself all the sins of the world? The bearing of those sins culminated with his death on the cross. But prior to that, the soldiers mocked him and beat him and tortured him with thorns. Prior to that, Pilate scourged him. Prior to that, he was assaulted about the face in front of the high priest. Prior to that, Peter's denial occurred within earshot. Prior to that, he was handed over to the authorities in history's most infamous betrayal. Prior to that, his hometown rejected him. Prior to that, many followers turned away from him. He was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, says the prophet. When did Jesus bear on himself all the sins of the world? When did he ever not do so? I just love that. What, what a, an extraordinary price to purchase our restoration. It's safe to say that there is not a single benefit that you or I enjoy in this life that came at a higher price than what Jesus paid. This, it seems to me, is the larger point of today's lesson. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the second statement on your listening guide. Jesus paid an extraordinary price for our restoration, not only on the cross, but throughout his entire journey into humanity from the manger to the cross, it is the single most expensive benefit we have in this life. All right, so Pilate is going to go out now and speak again to the Jewish leaders. Look what it says beginning in verse 4. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Again, we are left to speculate a little bit about what's, what is Pilate's thought process here? What are his motives? He seems to be showing them Jesus who is beaten and bloodied beyond recognition. And when I say beyond recognition, I don't just mean you wouldn't have been able to recognize him as Jesus. Most of the scholars believe that the beyond recognition would have meant he wasn't even recognizable as a human being at this point. 
And so was it number one, was it as a, as a means of playing on the Jewish leader's sympathies, hoping that they would have sympathy for him and change their minds? Or two, maybe perhaps he was just trying to convince them that this is enough, this punishment that he's been through is enough, and that there's no reason to go further than this with the crucifixion. We don't know. He says, behold the man. Isn't it possible that when he says, behold the man, What he's really saying there is, guys, look at him. Isn't this enough? Isn't that a possibility? I don't know. That interpretation, though, is supported by what follows in next week's lesson and what we're going to look at next week. It it really does uh, seem to support an interpretation of behold the man that says, take a look at this guy. Isn't this enough? He seems to be trying everything he can, Pilate that is, to get out of this conundrum that these Jewish leaders have placed him in. Again, like last week, I recall Matthew's comments in Matthew chapter 27. When Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. And then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged, Jesus delivered him to be crucified. You see, Pilate was a politician. Pilate was a master manipulator. He was just the ultimate politician. And he was trying to manipulate these Jewish leaders into doing what he thought should be done. Perhaps what you or I would have thought should have been done. That is not crucifying Jesus. But let's not forget, before we jump to that conclusion and say, this was all wrong, Jesus should never have been crucified, let's not forget that all of these circumstances are being used by a sovereign God in order to accomplish exactly what God wanted to happen, which was the crucifixion of His only Son. His greater will... In that regard, nobody was going to be able to manipulate the circumstances or control the circumstances in order to bring anything about other than what God wanted, which was Jesus' crucifixion. It was necessary for our restoration. We've got to keep that in mind as we read through these accounts of what feels unjust, what feels unfair to us. We've got to bear in mind that this is exactly what God wanted. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the third statement on your listening guide. It is a humbling thing when those of us who think we can manipulate people or circumstances to bring about what we want encounter a sovereign God who has his own ideas about how things should go. In the meantime, in the meantime, let's check in on our friend Peter. We said in lesson number one when we looked at Peter's life-changing failure his denial of even knowing Jesus. We said then that from time to time we will try to check in on him and ask what is he thinking, what is he doing when all of this is going on. We obviously, we do not know for sure uh, where Peter is. We don't know if he was there to witness what we've just read. Um, But what we do know is that there were witnesses to these events that we've just read about. And in this heightened uh, time of of a festival where all these people were there, There would have been plenty of talking about it, so word definitely would have gotten back to Peter. If he wasn't there to actually see these things, word definitely would have gotten back to him of what had just happened. This was a pretty significant event in Jerusalem, a high festival. So he would have heard these reports, and recall recall Peter's heart when when he followed Jesus into Caiaphas's courtyard after his arrest. Remember what he said back in John chapter 13, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, why can I not follow you? I will lay down my life for you. His heart was, I'm going anywhere you go. I'm going to follow you. And so it's very possible that Peter may have been there to see these events. What we do know is that he felt responsible for protecting Jesus. And we know that he went out and wept bitterly after even knowing Jesus. We know that he was at this deep, dark, depressed place as a result of having denied even knowing Jesus. Can you imagine what he would have felt watching this or hearing accounts of Jesus' scourging? Can you imagine what he would have felt upon seeing Jesus unrecognizable? 
I suspect he just fell deeper and deeper into despair and guilt and in desperate need for restoration. But he would have to wait. He would have to wait. There would be a great deal more pain and more misery to come before there was any hope at all for Peter's restoration. Sometimes that's the way the timing and the circumstances work with regard to our own failures in this life. Sometimes that restoration takes a lot longer than we think it should or than we want because we just need to sit in the pain that we have caused or that is going on as a result of our failures. If you have your listening guide, fill in the last statement on your listening guide. Sometimes genuine restoration requires that we sit long in the pain and the misery and the suffering our failures cause ourselves and others. Restoration rarely comes as quickly as we hope. And certainly that is something that Peter was experiencing as all of these events were unfolding. So what are our takeaways today about restoration and suffering? What are our takeaways? Number one, the God who restores us knows about suffering. He knows our struggles. Number two, our restoration came at an extraordinary price in Jesus. Number three, God's sovereignty humbles us when we think we can control or manipulate people or circumstances against a sovereign God. And number four, restoration rarely comes as quickly as we hope it will. We have to sit long in that pain, in that misery sometimes. These are my takeaways from this passage. I wonder what yours are. We will pick up right here where we've left off next week. In the meantime, I love you guys. We have an amazing week. We'll see you right here next time.